Awo, Shalom, Rastafari, in the name of Jesus Christos, Adonenu, Yeshua HaMoshiach, and our Black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is Wendem Yadam, and um, this is uh, going into the 17th of January. The 16th was um, MLK Martin Luther, or some say Lucifer King's. Junior's birthday. Now, there's some news that's circulating. Some of y'all may have caught hold of it um, concerning MLK, Martin Lucifer, Luther King Junior's um, memorial. There's a memorial in uh, in uh, D.C. No doubt you've heard something about that particular memorial in D.C. And we might have an article here. Um, concerning the memorial in D.C., how how there's a mistake with it, with what King has said. And we find that to be very ironic because we just did a, a new uh, DVD concerning lying dreams, um, lying words, too, that change the nation. So it's not here. It's not on this particular drive right here. We'll bring it up, but it's out there. Just look up. MLK Memorial, and um, that has to be changed. And this particular memorial, I think we have, uh, I think we have a still of this right here. It's this particular memorial right here. It's off screen, but let's bring it up front and center. Because we was asked by a, a brethren, had text, text messaged us, and they asked, so what do we think, you know, what do we feel actually about MLK? And we we'll like not to deal with this with so-called feelings, because this actually goes beyond feelings. And this is um, this is a picture, a close-up picture of this um, MLK memorial. And the stone looks remarkably like Egypt, and even D.C., as we've mentioned before, is m m remarkably like Egypt. In fact, when we get to study the Freemasonic and Illuminati, Luciferian and Satanistic, a whole connection with um, Washington, D.C., we can clearly see that Egypt is in mind. Now, this all comes together with uh, the Sabbath um, reading for this week's Sabbath, and this week's um, is known as a Shemot. Shemot, Shemot, or Simoch, the names. These are the names, which is which is this particular week's Torah portion, reading and feeding, which in 2012, this year, began um, on the eve of Friday, Friday the 13th. And the Shemot is the 13th uh, sabbatical reading and feeding in our a Hebraic uh, Torah portion cycle of reading and feedings. Now, um, we have a new document concerning the Sabbath house readings and feedings, and let's just bring up the cover of that as well. We've been meditating this because there's a spiritual warfare. We're in a period of time of intense and uh, kind of a low-grade spiritual warfare. Some of you all might feel this spiritual warfare. This is why the resource for us is prayer. And this is also why we've focused much on um, uh, prayer, you know, and the basics of our of our faith, and building up on this most holy faith of the King of Kings and His Christ, because we're living in spiritual Egypt. Now, this brings us to Revelation chapter eleven. Revelation chapter eleven, verse eight. And if you turn your Bibles, brothers and sisters, to Revelation chapter chapter 11. Now, we know that chapter 11 in Babylon is known as bankruptcy. And seeing that the theme of uh, Monday, January 16th, which was um, the previous light, as we would say, Rastafari, the previous day, that was Martin Luther King's um birthday. And with this memorial, this monument that has been built, there's been a lot of hype 
and a lot of uh, miseducation that many youths are being indoctrinated and brainwashed with believing, be lie, eving, the so-called dream lie or dreaming a lie. Because there's a lot of lies that have been associated with the whole civil rights movement um, as well as with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But as we start to study this this conspiracy, so-called conspiracy, the New World Order, so-called conspiracy, the Luciferian Satanistic agenda, the Freemasons and the Illuminati, we begin to see something that's a little bit um, shocking. And the the shocking thing, if you if you, if you don't know this for yourself, it will be shocking. Many will dismiss it as, as not being true, but that Martin Luther King and his um the memory or at least the, the the brainwashing the programming you know the programming of of the people to believe in this dream lie is all part of the illuminati and satanistic agenda now here's the cover this is the cover for this for the new uh dvd it's a two in one dvd that we have and this is the cover right here and let's show we had a uh, audio, so we have the audio here, the audio over here, this is the audio, and this is the DVD right here. I have a lying dream, really. I have a white girl's dream. I have a dream. So we, it's, it's a two-in-one, and we call it, one part is dream a lie, and the other part that exposes the lie behind this so-called dream of Martin Luther King, Jr. Now, connected with that, which is ironic, and, of course, in any other setting or situation, what you're seeing before you would be considered idolatry. But many black folks, so-called law sheep, those who are, um, how did Morpheus say, Morpheus, the lady in red scene where he says that they are so um, inanely or like in a state of inertia, they are so enslaved, hopelessly plugged into the system that they will even fight and die for the system. If you haven't looked at the whole speech of Martin Luther King Jr., the I Have a Dream speech, please get a transcript of it and just sit down and read it. You'll find that Unlike what we've been made to believe, the make-believe, that this was about freedom and equality, the whole march was basically about economics. The whole march was basically about money. And this is why this particular symbol is very important, as we now are going to touch on um, uh, Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. Let's take a look at what Revelation Chapter 11, verse 8. It says, And their dead bodies, right? And their dead bodies uh, shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually, now make note of that, it's describing that this great city is spiritually, so in spirit. This means that it might not be perceivable just on the outer physical and from the natural perspective, but it must be understood in spirit. It's called Sodom and Egypt. And it says, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, if we would think about this, this is Revelation chapter, chapter 11, verse 8 that our Lord, according to the Bible, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, or Yeshua HaMoshiach, Adonai. So, Jesus, or as they say, Jesus, but more correctly, Jesus, Iesus, Iusus, Yeshua, is our Lord, according to the Bible. This is Bible here. We're in Bible, right? But it says that our Lord was crucified in this place which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Now, remember, we're dealing with the book of Revelation. You see, the book of Revelation is about um, uh, symbolism, 
So we have to have a better understanding and understanding of symbolism. Now, do you understand, do you understand this symbolism, the symbolism that you are looking at, and what's really behind this particular symbolism? What do we have here? We have, first of all, a new coeptus. Some say this means announcing the birth, announcing the birth of Nuvos, Novus Ordo Seclorum. Novus Ordo Seclorum. We put up a video recently on our channel, and it's also contained in this um, new DVD, nearly five hours because the two-in-one is, is, is two, you could say, two teachings and lectures in one on one DVD. So it's a two-in-one, Dream a Lie. And I had a white girl's dream, or I have a white girl's dreams, lying dreams. And this is concerning a reexamination of Dr. Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech, since that's what most people know from that particular speech. If they say Martin Luther King, what's, what's the first thing you would associate with him? I have a dream. Then we get to now learn that the dream of Martin Lucifer King was not his dream, but was a very blonde and blue-eyed white girl who was saying this selfishly concerning her daughter playing with Negroes, black kids. And Dorothy Cotton Picking Nigger, she's the one who told it to King. And when you see our particular documentary, which is based on a CNN um, investigation, MLK words that changed a nation. We call it lying words that change a nation. And the documentary that's only played, as far as we know, only once, and we were able to catch a copy of it when it played a couple of years ago. I think this is when they first was announcing this particular um, monument that they were um, planning and conspiring to build, which is very Egypt. This particular monument is very Egypt. Now they have a controversy concerning what King said. Um, I am a drum major for 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 justice, uh, what freedom and righteousness, or something to that effect, which is a truncation of what he actually said. So there's a dispute. So what we know from even this present controversy concerning the MLK um, monument is that they're changing words and they've been manipulating. But it's not just with this monument now that they've manipulated Dr. King's uh, legacy, his history, who he was, what he did, so forth and so on. But it's really what they did with this lying dream. And the fact that this controversy was already known in certain circles before they, they opened up the memorial, but they kept that on the hush-hush. You know what I'm saying? They kept them the hush hush. They didn't want to spoil the celebration for this civil rights Disneyland, or, or we can call it what the Michael Jackson called his. Um, um, he he had a, like a Wonderland, Disneyland, or something to that effect. But this is like a Disneyland that they put for black folks. But this is all a part of the curse for disobedience. For instead of coming out of Babylon, instead of coming out of spiritual Egypt, the MLK, I have a dream, and the lying dream, and what was really behind the dream, just proves the big picture. It just it just goes to prove the big picture. Now we have a um, DVD. I think it's Studs Terkel, but this DVD though, it's it's an audio that video or stills had been added to it to, you know, make it into a video form, but it's based on the audio that um, we think that the Studs Terkel, who actually is narrating this and is giving the background of the whole Illuminati conspiracy, and this, this audio, the audio part, which is the older part of it, it was recorded, I think, during the time of the Johnson administration. When you listen to it, and when you hear who's who, who's in office, who's the rulers, who's controlling things, you get to find out that it's actually um, President Johnson. And now what's so very interesting about this particular um, document 
that we have that we're going to share some of it with you is how it reveals that behind this or connected with this Illuminati agenda is the civil rights movement. In other words, the civil rights movement. Now, what they have not revealed, because that's that's the big deal, they'll do everything not to um, confirm this, that Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream was not part of his original message. But somehow they were able to get through to Martin Luther King and at the last minute, he threw it in, and it was not part of his prepared speech, so forth and so on. So if we would ask ourselves, where did the inspiration for this I Have a Dream actually come from? The best recorded evidence that we have, and we have this on film, and it's on this particular DVD, I Have a Dream, Lie and Dreams, Dream a Lie, this two-in-one DVD, based on the statements of Dorothy Cotton or Dorothy Cotton picking niggas, she tells us that it was a, a, a very blonde and very blue-eyed white girl that actually said this to her. She repeated this to Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King would work with his staff, and they dismissed that. They said, let's focus on these other real economic, so forth and so on, issues. And at the last minute, King would say it, and you see in the documentary, the CNN documentary, and in our lecture, you will actually see where those who were alive and part of King's staff, they were, they were almost flabbergasted. They were, one even said, um, expletive, deleted, deleted, you know, curse, because after all this work that we did, he still went into that dream section. Now, some might dismiss this as really being very important. Some might say that's a, that's a minor thing right there. But when you put it in context with what we call the big picture, when you start to recognize, well, who was behind the NAACP? Who was really behind the NAACP? What was the agenda behind the NAACP, the shocking and very ironic thing that you will find is the very same people who are behind the so-called New World Order. And it was the NAACP and the Civil Rights Movement is a part of this spiritual Egypt. And when we get into the prophetic portion of Scripture, like in um, the prophet Isaiah, which speaks about how they would go down to Egypt, and many have said that this is a, was an end-time view, a latter-day view, not a prophecy of what was to happen to the Israelites in Old Testament time, but to the lost black sheep of the Beit Israel, of the house of Israel in New Testament times or in this prophetic time. And we declare to you this is exactly what happened in the 60s. Instead of ones coming out of Babylon or out of Sodom and Gomorrah, out of Egypt, they actually went down into Egypt. Now, here's the symbol again. Now, we also find the symbol in, in, in prophecy. We find this symbol in the earth. You understand? And we find, let's go to this symbol for a moment to let you understand this. Now, when you see the DVD that we have and the, and the production that we did, we also connected um, an Outer Limits episode, a particular Outer Limits episode that's known as Controlled Experiment. You might see one of the versions of it on our channel. We, we uploaded it and we put on the Controlled Experiment. And some might get it a little bit, but don't really see the connection with this in our video we make that connection and we try to present that visually and on screen and put it together so that ones can now get to see the truth and recognize the truth for themselves so this let's go to um this um what they call this resemblance what what is the resemblance right the resemblance in all of the earth. In Zechariah, we now are going to go to Zechariah 5 and 6. And I want you to pay attention to this verse right here. This is Zechariah 5 and 6, all right? 
Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, chapter 5, at verse 6. It says, And I said, What is it, or what it? And he said, This, an ephah, this is an ephah, a particular weight, a measurement of a weight, right? Weights and measures, right? That goeth forth, he said, Moreover, this is, or this there, resemblance. You see this word resemblance? Pay attention to this. This is their resemblance through all the earth. Now, let's look at that word resemblance. When we click on that word resemblance, do you see what comes up right here? Here's what comes up for resemblance. Let's let's bring it up a little bit a little bit more. This is their resemblance in all of the earth. Did you see that click down there? This Okay, here we go. This is their resemblance. So we're looking at the word resemblance, right? We might have to undock this. Let us um, undock this right here. Let's, okay, here we go. Here we go. This is, this is their resemblance in all of the earth. It says it's the H, the Hebrew 5869. 5869, right? 5869 is the word ayin. A-yin. 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 The Hebrew 5869, it means an eye, literally or figuratively. So the word that we have in Isaiah, uh, Zechariah, in Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, chapter 5, verse 6 that they translate, King James translate as resemblance. In the Hebrew, it is literally an eye. It's an eye, literally or figuratively. By analogy, it's a fountain as the eye of the landscape. They say this is probably a primitive, an ancient word. Now, when we look at the eye in ancient Egypt and in ancient cultures, we can see that there was an understanding of this word that was known to the prophet, and the prophet would say this. The prophet would say concerning this, this particular vision here, he says, and he said, what is it? And he said, this is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, moreover, this is their resemblance, or this is their eye, their oin, their oin, their eye, through all the earth. And here we have it down here, oin. Literally or and figuratively, either a literal eye or a figurative eye, by analogy, a fountain. So now when we look at this particular image, it becomes very much more clear. What is this? What is it? This is their resemblance. This is like this. This is their resemblance in all of the earth. Now, where do we find this particular image? You understand? We find this particular image, right? We find this particular image on the $1. Here we have it again on the $1 bill. Now, when you listen to Dr. Martin Luther King speaking, he's speaking about, we came here to cast a check. Listen to the full speech of Dr. King. I have a dream speech. Listen to the full speech. So what we want to connect this is civil rights, the lost sheep, black people. This is so speaking about spiritual Egypt, the civil rights movement, the connection with the Illuminati, and the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Instead of coming out of Egypt, Right After 400 plus years, they went further into Egypt. Instead of recognizing that we was brought here in fulfillment of biblical, of God's prophecy, Martin Lucifer King would present to the people a lying dream. Now, moreover, when we get into um, Jeremiah, Jeremiah will reveal to us how serious that is when one who is a so-called man of God, instead of proclaiming what God doth say in the Bible, is moved by public, private, Illuminati, or whatever other influence or opinion to put forward a lie or a false dream 
as though it is God's word. Now, we were asked, what do we feel about this? We're not talking about what we feel about this, because what we feel about this is really more than words can say. We feel like the brother in the in the video, in the documentary, um, that says, um, that says, expletive, deleted, deleted. He said, ah, expletive, deleted, deleted. Let's go to Jeremiah for a moment. We want to find out what is the truth about this. Now, when we get, go to Jeremiah chapter 23, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 25, Jeremiah 23, verse, four, verse uh, 25, it says, now this is the Lord speaking, this is Yahweh, Yahweh, this is Jah speaking. This is the Lord God of Israel speaking, saying, I have heard what the prophets, the prophets, preachers, and pastors, even in the New Testament sense, are connected with the Old Testament prophets. Was Dr. King a preacher? Was he a pastor? Yes. Therefore, he is even considered even now as a prophet, but they have made him now an idol, you understand, in their spiritual Egypt. On the, on, in, the, in the monument, we can see that connection with what happened in ancient Egypt. You understand that is, that is the most striking and shocking form of basic, not just the statue of him, but everything else that has been made to believe in the brainwashing of a whole generation of black children. What's going to happen when they finally find out the truth? What, what are ones going to say who know that there's these inconsistencies to what we've been made to believe concerning Martin Lucifer King, you understand, as a people, you understand, and in particular with this particular lying dreams. I have a white girl's dream, you understand, Dorothy Cotton makes that explicitly clear, at all expletive deleted deleted. Wasn't expecting that after all that work, staying up all night to work on that particular speech. Normalcy. It was called normalcy. Never again. That's a particular speech. And if you read the entire speech, as the CNN documentary points out, nowhere in that speech does it say, I have a dream. So where would this come from? What was the link? Well, the Bible now tells us something very important. And the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 25, it says, I have heard what the prophet said. I've heard what the prophet said, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. This is shocking right here. This is Bible. Now, when you go to Jeremiah chapter 23, read the fuller context. The fuller context of it just backs up exactly who we are as a people, the once lost but now found Beta Israel. When we're reading the Bible, the Old Testament, we're reading about black folks. When we're reading the prophecies, we're reading about Ethiopian and Hebrew black people. You know, and that's that's the half of the story that has not been told because many have been duped and willingly have believed the lie and have put the lie forward like unfortunately dr king is that primary one now we have this this um this modern situation where they're saying that um the words on the king memorial are misquoted when will they tell us that I have a white girl's dream, and the whole dream was also a misquote as well. But there's a bigger context to it. You see, there's a bigger context. Because what we're speaking about essentially is this, is spiritual Egypt. This is what we're speaking about. Instead of coming out of Egypt, the people went further down into Egypt. And that's what's behind this big deception of the so-called civil rights movement. And, and we have yet to put together and, and to, to, to make the connection. We're going to show you part of the video 
where I think it's Studs Terkel, but back in Johnson's time, which is the what the late to early 60s, when this particular um, expose on the Freemasons and New World Order and the real um, Illuminous conspiracy in forming and founding and backing many black dupes, black and Jewish dupes, ones who were duped, you understand, into working unconsciously for the New World Order agenda when we get to see the bigger picture. But let's just connect right here down to Egypt. We want to connect this scripture right here so you can see what the word says concerning that going down to Egypt. Now, the Civil Rights March, what was that about? That was about economics. The Civil Rights March was all about money, basically. Even Dr. King says it in his particular speech that they have given a check, right? A check has been given, and when they try to cash the check, it's marked insufficient funds. Now, do you understand the monetary system? Do you understand who and what is behind the whole monetary system? Do you understand the connection of this symbol, you understand, both to the monetary system and to what's going on currently in this world and in this particular system? Let's get that money. Where's, where's the money symbol right here? Now, this is a, a collage right here of King and there we go right there, Nuvos Ordo Seclorum. So when you listen to King's speech, this is what King had in mind right here. But then he segued to this I have a dream thing. So most of the people were expecting him to speak about the economics, about, about the economic justice, because he was saying that having these freedoms and so-called equality, you understand, know without having the money, basically is meaningless, you know, but then he segued into this, I have a dream, I have a dream thing. Now, we just touched on Jeremiah 23 and 25, so we should be very clear what Jah, what God says about the prophets that prophesy lies. Instead of talking about what his word really says and telling the black people who they really are, instead fed them a dream fed them a lie. L listen to how this, this new uh, translation says. It says, the Lord says, I have heard what those prophets who prophesy, who are prophesying lies in my name are saying. They are saying, I have had a dream. I have had a dream. Now, what's the biggest manifestation of that? Did, did King, as a man of God, know this? Should King, as a pastor or a preacher, should he have should he have known this? Well, of course, he should have known this. And if he didn't, there's really no excuse for that. But let's touch on going down to Egypt. When we go to Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah, when Isaiah, Isaiah chapter um, 30, verse 2, it says that these are they that go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth, to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh. Pharaoh here to be interpreted as the White House, Pharaoh, not just an individual who is the king, you understand, but as the whole institution of government. Like they say, the White House says, or Pharaoh says. So Pharaoh both refers to the institution and to that individual, you understand, a representative king or that man who sits upon that particular throne or in that particular seat of power. But Pharaoh, you understand, in our understanding of this, in this prophetic time, speaking about the civil rights movement, this will be interpreted as the White House, and going down to Egypt spiritually is interpreted as going down to D.C. You understand? And notice what it says. It says that they walk to go down. It was a what? What kind of thing it was? It was a march the march on Washington or walking to go down into Egypt, but not asking at my mouth. They did not ask at God's mouth. But who were they led by? They were led by a whole bunch of Negro Baptist preachers, including Martin Lucifer King Jr., to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh. Not in the strength of God, but asking of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt, in the shadow of federalism or federal government, 
You know how Negroes always want to get a, a government job. So now you maybe can connect why the so-called conservatives and Republicans, they want a smaller government, you see, and the Democrats, they want a bigger government, you see, because it was through the whole so-called Democrats that this new Negro deal vis-a-vis King civil rights was made. So they want a smaller government, but the Negroes that went down to Egypt or to D.C., you understand, who did not ask at the mouth of God, that means they did not consult with the scriptures or God's word, to strengthen themselves in the strength of foul, foul symbolizes the White House or the federal government, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt, to trust in the shadow of D.C., the federal government, the Illuminati, the the the, the white uh, supremacy, basically. That's what's basically behind it, is the white European supremacy. And we know that the Constitution of the United States basically still says that black people are three-fifths of a white man. So those things have not changed. So people are not taught and told the whole truth. They're only taught enough, you know what I'm saying, to make them believe to make them believe and to keep them not knowing the full truth because the, the truth is what frees us. Some would say we shouldn't talk about these things. But the word tells us that ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So 40 years later, if we ask ourselves, are things, are black people better off? Well, those who have profited, you understand, by the double dealings against their own people, you understand, have gotten in bed with white supremacy, you know, and and keeping their people left behind, and keeping all the Negroes and the nigger, the, the black youths left behind. Because why are black people still in this situation? And foreigners are coming here every 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 day, and profit and rise above the head of the Negroes, who rightly can say their ancestors built this country, built this city, built this under slave masters' whip, of course. But this is the first verse of talking about going down to Egypt. Let's look at the next verse, which talks about, it says here in um, Isaiah chapter 31, the next chapter, it says, woe to them. It's not a blessing, but it tells us very clearly it is a woe to them. So we've been told so many lies. We've been told that this is a great thing. Everybody praises Dr. King. But then think about what the Bible says. It says, woe to you when the whole world will love you and the whole world will say nice things about you. But you're cursed, you're damned, you're effed, in other words. It says, woe, woe yo to them that do what? That go down to Egypt. We already have touched on Isaiah 30 and 2. It says that they walked down, and it was a march. The Civil Rights March was a, a march. They walked down to D.C., and D.C. is built on the templates of Egypt. It's not Egypt, but it confirms what the first verse that we touched on, Revelation 11 and, and 8, speaks about spiritually, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. And if you hear about some of those pedophilia things going on with some of those uh, politicians and stuff, they had this on the news and it's a known thing and a lot of other things, a lot of abuse, a lot of sodomy is going on down there as well. You understand? In spiritually and in reality. So woe to them that go down to Egypt for what? For help. What did King and the whole movement was going down to Egypt, to D.C. for help, and stay on horses and trust in chariots? You know, the cars, horsepower, nigga get a car, he think he's getting up in the world, bling, bling, because they are many. You know, look what white folks got. We need to get that, too. And in horsemen, because they are very strong. But what does it say right here? It says, but they look not to the Holy One of Israel. They didn't look to the Kedus of Israel. Neither seek the Lord. Neither do they seek Yahweh. Neither do they seek he who is, 
who he is. They did not seek the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. They didn't seek Adamawi Hala Selassie. They didn't seek the elect of God, the king of kings of Ethiopia. But they went down to Egypt. Check out this, this reading of it. It says, those who go down to Egypt for help are as good as dead. Think about black people's situation. The whole civil rights conspiracy and, and lost sheep of the house of Israel. Forty years later, are things really better? You understand? For the nigger, what happened? It was a lie. Those who go down to Egypt for help are as good as dead. Those who rely on war horses. And interesting, it gives us the context of the horses are war horses. What was going on back in the 60s? There was a war, Vietnam. That was also in the news. So we find that there's all these correspondences when we look at it prophetically. And trust in Egypt's many chariots and in their many, many horsemen. They didn't want to go to Africa. Those Negroes didn't want to go to Africa. You know saying? Let's go down to this one right here. So we have this going down to Egypt. The final verse in a, this going down to Egypt in Isaiah here is Isaiah 52 and 4, where it says, For thus saith Adonai, Adoni Yahweh. For thus saith Adonai, and then right here, Yahweh, my people, my people, so it's a particular people. You see, niggas wanted to assimilate and, and so forth and so on. They did not recognize because the preachers and the pastors, woe to them, were not preaching the full good news of the King of Kings and his Christ, was not showing the people that they are Beit Israel, they are Israelites. Their experience in America 400 plus years is prophesied in the Bible. My people went down a fourth time into Egypt to sojourn there, to spend some time there. And the Assyrian, this is interesting how it says the Assyrian here and the prophet. We've been told that, well, it was the Egyptians that was per the black Egyptian persecuting so-called whitewashed Jews. That's a lie, too. But here the word is telling us it was the Assyrian that oppressed them without cause, that the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. So these are a few of the correspondences that we have, that they walked. For example, right here, they walked the march down to D.C., the march on Washington, the march down to D.C., Washington, and have not asked at my mouth. They did not ask at Yahweh at at God's mouth. Instead, it was for political um, expediency. It was PC. It was, but using the preachers and the pastors, because they knew that the preachers and the pastors, the people were like sheeple, black folks like sheeple. If that preacher or pastor was preaching about civil rights and the march on Washington, going down to Egypt, the people would be down to, to they were like sheep. And these were like shepherds. But if you go to Jeremiah chapter 23, the I have a dream, I have a dream chapter, you'll find out that Yahweh, that Jah already pegged them as false shepherds. You understand that they were false shepherds and they were pastors, you understand, that led my people astray. So now they've erected this monument, you understand, as part of the further enslavement of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It brings us once again back to uh, Genesis chapter 15, where it says about your people will be a stranger in a land that's not their own. King and the rest of them lied, too, to the people. They were telling them that America is their own. And, and I know there's many Negroes, lost sheep, that you cannot convince them otherwise, as, as Morpheus even said. You understand, they are so hopelessly um, dependent on the system that they, like the lady in red, will fight for the system. These are things that we have to become mature about and just recognize the, the real story, the half of the truth that has not been told to us. That's the only way we can come out of Babylon spiritually psychologically and ultimately physically we have to first dis dis dislodge from the counterfeit spirituality the blonde hair blue-eyed jesus because you know they w these niggas would listen to a very blonde blue-eyed white girl 
who says that she has a dream, a selfish dream, for her daughter to play with some niggas, and this would influence Dorothy, the Dorothy cotton-picking Negroes, the black woman who look up and worship the white Jesus image, you understand, to raise their boys, you understand, also to look up and to glorify or deify, you understand, that counterfeit image. So anything they say is the gospel. If the blonde hair, blue eye would say, yes, that was all a lie and a fraud, then the lost sheep would realize it. Then the black folks would recognize it. But because one of their own, as it says, I've come to, what well, he's come to his own and his own would not accept it. But those who would, as many heads who would, he gave them authority, you understand, to become the children, to assume the name. You understand? To assume the name, Jah Rastafari, in the name of Jesus Christo. So, brothers and sisters, um, those who get a chance, check out this. Look forward to this DVD. This is a DVD, a two-in-one DVD. I have a dream or lying dreams that change the nation, dream or lie, a, a two-in-one DVD. It's nearly five hours, and also there's an audio, too that we did previously for a little bit more of our reasonings and lectures on this um, particular topic of very important interest as we get to learn more about what and where is this um, spiritual Egypt. Now, before we go forward, you understand, before we go forward with this, let us... Uh, uh, show you this part of the video where we talk about the New World Order, the Illuminati connection, Freemasonic connection with the whole civil rights thing. So let's, um, okay, okay, here's, uh, here's, uh, Bush and them, and, um, here, so this is from this particular documentary, and we'll give you a, uh, a peek of this. And all federal agencies, number three, create minority group strife throughout the nation, particularly between whites and blacks. Number four, create a... You see, let's go back to that when he says, um... Number three. Let's go back. Right. Congress and the U.S. Supreme Court and all federal agencies. Number three, create minority group strife throughout the nation particularly between whites and blacks. Number four, create a movement to destroy religion in the United States, but Christianity to be the chief target. Together, those two minority groups, properly maneuvered, could be used to create exactly the kind of strife in America the Illuminati would need to accomplish their objectives. Thus, at the same time that Schiff and his co-conspirators were laying their plans for the entrapment of our money system, they were also protecting plans to hit the unsuspecting American people with an explosive and terrifying racial upheaval that would tear the people into hate fractions and create chaos throughout the nation, especially on all college and university campuses, all protected by early Warren decisions and our so-called leaders in Washington. Of course, perfecting those plans required time and infinitely patient organizing. Now, to leave those out, I'll take a few moments to give you documentary proof of this racial strife plot. First of all, they have to create leaders and organizations to bring in millions of groups, both Jewish and Negroes, who will then be demonstrating and commit the rioting, looting, and lawlessness. So in 1909, Schiff, the Laymans, and other conspirators organized and set up the National Association for the Advancement of the Colored People, known as the NAACP. The presidents, directors, and legal counsels of the NAACP were always white men, Jews appointed by Schiff. And this is the case to this very day. Then, in 1913, the Schiff Group organized the Anti-Defamation League of the Benite Group, commonly known as the ADL, to serve as the Gestapo and Hatchet Man outfit for the entire great conspiracy. Today, this sinister ADL maintains over 2,000 agencies in all parts of the country, 
and they advise and completely control every action of the NACP or of the Urban League of all the other so-called Negro civil rights organizations throughout the nation, including such leaders as Martin Luther King, King, Stokely Carmichael, Dave Rustin, and others of that ilk. In addition, the ADL acquired absolute control of the advertising budgets of many department stores, hotel chains, and TV and radio industrialist sponsors, also advertising agencies, in order to control practically all the mass communications media and force every known newspaper to slant and falsify the news and to further incite and at the same time create sympathy for the lawlessness and violence of the Negro mob. Here is documentary proof of the beginning of their deliberate plot to foment the Negroes into all their lawlessness. Around 1910, one Israel Zangwill wrote a play entitled The Melting Pot. It was sheer propaganda to incite the Negroes and Jews because the play purportedly visualized how the American people were discriminating against and persecuting Jews and Negroes. At that time, nobody seemed to realize that it was a propaganda play. It was that cleverly written. The propaganda was well wrapped up and the true great entertainment in the play, and it was a big Broadway hit. Now, in those years, the legendary Diamond Jim Brady used to throw a banquet at the famous Delmonico restaurant in New York after the opening performance of a popular play. He threw such a party for the cast of The Melting Pot, its author, producer, and chosen Broadway celebrities. By then, I already made a personal mark on the Broadway theater and was invited to that party. There I met George Bernard Shaw and a Jewish writer named Israel Cohen. When Will Shaw and Cohen were the triumvirate who created the Fabian Society in England and had worked closely with a Frankfurt Jew named Mordecai who had changed his name to Karl Marx. But remember, at that time, both Marxism and communism were just emerging and nobody paid much attention to either and nobody suspected the propaganda in the writings of those three youths. At that banquet, Israel Cohen told me he was then engaged in writing a book which was to be a follow-up on Zangwill's The Melting Pot. The title of his book was to be a racial program for the 20th century. At that time, I was completely absorbed by my work as a playwright, and significant as that title was, his real objective never dawned on me, nor was I interested in reading the book. But it suddenly hit me with the force of a hydrogen bomb when I received a newspaper clipping of an item published by the Washington, D.C. Evening Star in May 1957. That item was a verbatim reprint of the following excerpt in Israel Cohen's book, A Racial Program for the 20th Century. And it reads, as I quote, We must realize that our party's most powerful weapon is racial tension. By propounding into the consciousness of the dark races that for centuries they have been oppressed by the whites, we can move into the program of the Communist Party. In America, we will aim for supper victory. While inflaming the Negro minority against the whites, we will instill in the whites a guilt complex for their exploitation of the Negroes. We will aim the Negroes to rise to prominence in every walk of life in the professions and in the world of sports and entertainment. With this prestige, the Negro will be able to intermarry with the whites and begin a process which will deliver America to our cause. That same excerpt was entered into the Congressional Record of June 7, 1957 by Representative Thomas G. Abernathy. Thus, the authenticity of that passage in Cohen's book was fully established. But the one question that remained in my mind was whether it represented the official policy or plot of the Communist Party or just a personal expression of Cohen himself. Since I sought more proof, and I found it, in an official pamphlet published in 1935 by the New York Communist Party's official 
Wilbur's Library Publishers. That pamphlet was entitled The Negroes in the Soviet America. It urged the Negroes to rise up for the Soviet state of the South and apply for admission to the Soviet Union. It contained a firm pledge that the revolt would be supported by all American Reds and all so-called liberals. On page 38, it promised that a Soviet government would confer greater benefits to Negroes than to whites. And again, this official communist pamphlet pledged that, I quote, any act of discrimination or prejudice against a Negro will become a crime under the revolutionary law. Unquote. That statement proved that the excerpt to Gabriel Cohen's book, published in 1913, was an official edict of the Communist Party and directly in line with the Illuminati blueprint for world revolution issued by White House and later by Albert Hall.